Well, this week we as a staff did a staff cleanup day. So a handful of times throughout the year, we take our entire staff and we spend an entire day and we clean something. This week, we went down to the basement. The church has a basement underneath the whole atrium is a giant basement. It's got a bunch of cages in it and it was filled with junk. And here's the thing when you are going to clean out something, there's two types of personalities that typically exist. There's one type of personality, and I would say that I've got this type of personality, that their mindset is when in doubt, throw it out. And so they look at something and they say, we haven't used this in over a year, it's probably time to get rid of it. But then there's another personality. And maybe you are in this personality type and they look at something and they say, well, I haven't used this in a few years, but what if maybe there's a chance. So here's a good litmus test to know if you are that personality type or not. If you haven't replaced your toothbrush in two years, you're that personality type. (laughs) Those are those people that they're just holding on. They're holding on no matter what. They don't like change. Coming to Colorado, basements are kind of a new thing. We didn't have basements down in Texas. And so sometimes my kids, when we go into someone's house for the very first time, they will immediately walk into their house and they'll say, can we go down into your basement? And I said to my kids, hey, that sounds creepy. I don't know why, but going into someone's house and saying, can we see your basement? I I don't know. And the reason is because most of the time the basement is where you put the junk. The basement is where you have stuff that you haven't used since 1996 and you don't know why you still have it and yet you still have it. And so occasionally you have to take the junk out of the basement in order to get new stuff and go a new direction and do new things. In our lives, so often we can fill up our lives with junk, stuff that we hold on to, stuff that we cling to, And in order for God to do new things in our life, we have to be willing to let go of the old things. The book of James is one of my favorite books in the Bible because it's a really practical book. And here's what James wants you and I to understand. He wants us to grasp that James is saying, if you would just let go of some of your old self, some of your old life, some of these old things that you're clinging on to, if you would just turn and pursue Jesus, he has so many new and wonderful and amazing things for you. The book of James is the earliest book written in the New Testament. It was probably written somewhere between 40 and 50 AD. It was written before any other book. And so imagine if you will, you are in the first century. You're in the early church. Uh, You and I, we have the luxury of having God's word. We have a Bible so we can teach through the Bible and walk through the Bible as we should. But in the first century, they didn't have a Bible. And so the teachings of Jesus were being taught through the apostles, through the disciples, and they were being spread around. And then what James does is he writes the first book, the first letter, and it's a way to give the Christians at the time the understanding of what it means to be a Christian. Jesus' brother, James, who grew up, spent all of his life with Jesus, knew Jesus better than probably anybody else alive, save maybe his mom. That person writes a letter that says, hey, if you wanna be a Christian, if you wanna follow after Jesus, if you wanna pursue what he's got for you, this is the lifestyle that God is calling you to live. I think just as in the first century, it was very practical, the same is true in 2022. That if we want to live lives engaged in culture in a powerful way, James helps give us the roadmap of what that looks like. If you've got a Bible, turn with me to the book of James. It's just after Hebrews. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen. All the notes, as always, are in the Cherry Hills app, so you can follow along there as well. James chapter one, starting in verse one, this is what it says. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, a couple interesting things. One, this is just a side note. James is the Greek name of James. His Hebrew name would be Jacob. So originally this term in the original is Jacob. Uh, so his Hebrew name would be Jacob. His Greek name would be James. Uh, the reason that Jacob is kind of cool, because then he starts the letter by saying to the 12 tribes and the dispersion greetings. He's, he's basically saying to all the Christians, but there's this nod to the 12 tribes where he comes from. Jacob is the father of Israel. Uh, but his title here is fascinating because in the first century, if you're writing a letter, the first thing you say is your credentials. You say, Kurt, I am thee. And then you, you kind of give your, your profile, your career, your achievement. You're giving the reason that people should pay attention to what you're saying. And if I'm James, 
I probably write James, comma, Jesus was my brother. <laughs> Listen up. That's probably what I write, but that's not what he writes. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying that he's doulos. He's a slave of God, a bond servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says to the 12 tribes of Israel, the dispersion means that they're spread out all over. And just as in the first century he was writing to everybody, it would apply just as much to us, to all of us. Listen up, this is what he has to say. Verse two, it says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, if that pauses right there, it's kind of an odd statement. Count it all joy when you encounter trials of many kinds. That the trials could be pain, could be suffering, could be difficulty, could be challenges in life. And this, this joy that he describes here is a continuous joy. It's not a one-time emotion. It's a continuous persevering joy. And he's saying, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. If you interpret it the wrong way, it, it sounds off. It sounds almost like a masochist, that you enjoy pain, you enjoy suffering, you enjoy the bad. But that's not what James is saying. Fortunately, there's this word for. So he's saying we're supposed to consider it joy when we're going through difficult times, going through trials for, here's the reason for those trials. The reason those trials can give us a perspective of joy is because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing. Let's break down a few of these words. Uh, so this first part, when it says count it all joy, you probably, you might have a translation that says consider it all joy. Uh, there's a few different ways to translate it. Uh, but if you look at the meaning of count it all joy, it's actually an accountant term. So it's an accountant term that says that you are going to evaluate or more specifically that you are consciously recognizing. So this idea of you going through a trial, you going through a difficult time, you going through pain and suffering, he's saying, take a step back and consciously recognize, have perspective on what it is you're going through. Look at it, evaluate it, consider it, weigh it. Then he goes on and this next phrase, he talks about when. He doesn't say if, he says, when you encounter, uh, that's the truth that you live long enough and you realize it's true. For some of us in this room, you right now are walking through a difficult season. You right now are in the midst of a trial, a pain, a circumstance, could be health, could be job, could be finances, could be because of a relationship. So right now you're in the midst of that trial. Maybe you aren't in the midst of a trial. What James is saying and what you know to be true in life is that if you aren't in a trial right now, eventually you will be in the trial. And when it says, when you meet, uh, in the Greek there, it's this picture of fall into or unexpectedly plunge or surrounded by trials. It's kind of a picture of you're walking along and then all of a sudden whoosh, the bottom falls out and you fall into a pit. So often that is the case when we go through trials. So often when we go through difficulty, it's not something that we were expecting. It's not something that we were planning on. It's not something that we wanted, but all of a sudden we get plunged into it. And James is saying, when that happens, because it will happen, when the bottom falls out that you should take a step back and consider it and weigh it and recognize what's going on. Then that next word, which is so profound is that word steadfast, or your translation might have patience or it might have endurance. In the Greek, it's this word hypomone. It's perseverance, steadfastness, patience, endurance. Uh, but what's cool about this word in particular is it's a word picture. So it's two different words in the Greek. It's hippo, which means under, and it's meno, which means to stay. And so the visual picture that it, James is trying to get us to see what perseverance represents is that you have a great weight. It is lifted up above your head and you are underneath it. Now, fortunately, this isn't that heavy. I, I could have picked up the TV, but I decided, I decided I couldn't do that physically. This isn't that heavy, but guess what? The longer you hold it up, the heavier it begins to get. And just like working out when you're holding a great weight above your head, 
the longer you hold it, the more it burns and burns and burns and burns. And some people, when the moment that you have any difficulty, the moment that you have any pain, the first thing that you wanna do is get out from underneath that pain. The first thing you wanna do is chunk that pain, get past that pain, but that's not what James is saying. James is saying that when you're going through difficult times, that you are to be steadfast. You are to persevere underneath that great weight that is above you in your life. You're, you're standing underneath it. And then he says, you're supposed to consider it joy, weigh it, consider it, look at it, and then have this ongoing joy. Now, you don't have ongoing joy because of the pain. You're not supposed to look at the pain, the suffering, the circumstance, and say, oh, I'm just so happy because my dog died. That's not the picture. The picture is that you are supposed to have joy in the circumstance because when having perspective, that, that next part says for, for the trials, the difficulties that you're going through, God is using those things in your life to bring about something bigger, something greater. What's that next phrase? He says that those trials, those difficulties can make us mature and complete not lacking anything. This phrase in the Greek, perfect and complete, it could be a picture of two different things. One, it could be a picture going back to the Old Testament of a sacrifice. That the same word here gets used in sacrificial language. So if a sacrifice is mature and complete, that means it is a sacrifice that is fully satisfying to God. Uh, fully holy to God, mature and complete. The other way that people could interpret it is that this word gets used by soldiers. So a soldier that has gone through the rigors of training, they've gone through all the challenges and they've worked out physically and they've worked out mentally and they've worked out emotionally. Once they are prepared and ready for their assignment, they, in the Greek, this word, they've become perfect and complete. They're ready, they're capable. So what James is pointing to you and to I is that when we go through challenges in life, we go through the pit of life, that if we can be steadfast, that God can use that moment in our life, that season of our life to be building about and building in and through us something greater than what we were before. That that pain can help us to become mature and complete, perfect and complete ready to be used by God, stand fit before God for all that God would have for us. Now, interestingly, oftentimes psychologists will do lots of research. And if you really study the research, you find that what they have discovered is the exact same as what God's word already says. Now, there's a great TED talk by a lady named uh, Dr. Lisa Hone. Uh, and she talks about three strategies to be resilient. So for those people in life that they go through challenges, they go through difficulties, they go through pain, that they come out the other side full of life and vibrant, that they had these consistent things in studying them, that there was these consistent characteristics that they found. And here are the three key things that she says, if you're gonna be resilient, if you're gonna make it through, here's what you need to learn. Number one is that resilient people get that suffering is a part of life. It's exactly what James said. James didn't say, well, if you ever have suffering in life, he said, when you have suffering in life, we will all go through suffering. We will all go through trials and challenges. So you shouldn't be surprised when that happens. You should recognize that this is part of what happens in life. And so when you're in those challenges, number two, she says resilient people are careful where they focus their attention. You see, so often when we're going through difficult things, our attention goes the wrong direction. Our attention either can go so focused on the pain and the sorrow that you block out everything else, you don't look up at all, or sometimes in order to avoid that pain and sorrow, our attention goes to the wrong things. Our attention goes to unhealthy things. She says that you need to focus on what you can control, focus on the good. Anxiety, when they do studies on what anxiety is. Anxiety is the same part of your brain that lights up, triggers when you are under duress or in fear for your life. So if you're in the middle of the woods and you're walking and all of a sudden a bear jumps out, there's a part of your brain that lights up because you are scared of the bear. 
and you should be scared of the bear. Now, anxiety means that there is no immediate threat to your health. There's nothing that's about to happen to you. And yet that same part of your brain is lighting up because you're scared. So often anxiety is focused on the what could be. And you've been there before. You go through a challenging time, uh, you experience some type of pain, and then for the rest of the, the month or the day or the season that you're going through that, you're always thinking about the worst case scenario. Oh, uh, what could happen? This is, this is what might happen. <coughs> you, you've had maybe a health crisis before, and they say, we're not really sure what it is. Here, here's some options. And, and your mind typically naturally goes to the worst case scenario. And then you start so thinking about that worst case scenario and then you take it 10 years past that. Well, if that happens and this could happen and this could happen and then your mind gets focused on that. And here's the challenge of that is that you can't control that at all. It can become the overwhelming focus of our life. And instead, what she would say is that we need to focus on the good. In James, that next verse, verse five, he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. It's this continuation of perseverance. He, he transitions into saying, okay, if you're gonna persevere, your focus needs to be on God. You're going through a difficult season, a difficult challenge. You've got pain and suffering. He's saying you're supposed to consider it. You're supposed to weigh it. But then he says, pursue God's wisdom. How do you do that? By focusing on him. The third thing she says is this. She says, resilient people ask themselves, is what I'm doing helping or harming me? By doing so, that puts you in the driver's seat to take back control. When all you're doing is thinking about the worst case scenario, is that helping or harming? And when you are going through that challenge and you start to look at other coping mechanisms, things that are just distracting you away, are those things helping you or harming you? When you don't wanna be around people and you just wanna isolate and wallow in the challenges that you have, is that helping you or is that harming you? And here's the truth, in those situations, it's not easy. Nothing that you can do in that moment is gonna take away the pain, but it is possible to get through it. Five years ago, we've shared before that my wife and I, we, we lost our, our third child. Um, our oldest is Bran, our second is Kinley, our third was Lane. Uh, she was born sick. She lived to be four months old. She was in the hospital that entire time. Then she got an infection and she died. And that season, both when she was in the hospital working through that whole season and then on the heels of the hospital when she died and passed away, it, it was, you want to talk about just the bottom falling out. It was just total pit of despair. The, the pain was just so ragged. And, and all you wanted to do is you wanted to crawl into a hole, not talk to anybody, just focus on the pain, and you, you really felt like you wanted to die. That was the feeling that happened. But if that's all we did, it could ruin and destroy our life. That when you go through challenges like that, here's what happens in every relationship in your life. You go through difficulties, either those difficulties will cause you to lean into those relationships and so you will grow deeper in that relationship or that moment of pain will cause you to go away from that relationship. So with our marriage, that was a moment that could have easily driven us apart or it was gonna be a moment that drew us together. In our relationship with God, that was a moment that was either gonna drive us apart or it was going to drive us towards him. And so when you're in those seasons, when you're going through terrible, terrible pain, you have to recognize this question of, okay, am I doing something that's healthy, that's beneficial, or am I doing something that's destructive? And the reality is the pain doesn't go away like that. There's nothing that you can do that's gonna make that pain go away. And when you've experienced raw, raw pain like that, the hope is not that it goes away because that pain stays with you for the rest of your life, but the hope is that, that through pursuing health, through pursuing the right things, that you can learn to live with that pain. It's like this open wound that exists in your life. That open wound never closes up. It always hurts, but eventually you figure out how to live life despite the wound that is there. And it's possible, you can do it. But what we often wanna do is the opposite. What we often wanna do is just wallow in it and focus on nothing but it. And so we're supposed to focus on God. 
James and the rest of these verses right after this, in verse nine, he specifically talks about difficulties of, of being poor and difficulties of being rich, saying both of those things are challenges in different ways. He talks about verse 12, he says, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under the trial. And then verse 14, he says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So, so get the, the picture of what's happening here. He's talking about persevering. He's talking about the difficulties that, that we face when we're experiencing suffering. And then he's reminding us that in those moments that we get tempted, we can be tempted to do it the wrong way. Verse 15, he says, then desire when it is conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown brings forth death. So when we're going through challenging times, we can so go wrong, the wrong way because that temptation is so real that it ends up destroying our life. You have a challenge, you have a difficulty, you're at this crossroads in life. God can either use it in your life to make you mature and complete, or that can be a moment in your life that leads towards total and utter destruction. St. Augustine has this beautiful quote where He's just giving us this encouragement to say that God had one son on earth without sin, without sin. He's talking about Jesus, but never one without suffering. That you and I will experience suffering and so did Jesus. God understands your pain. God understands your suffering. God understands the difficulty that you're going through. And the promise here is that if you will just hold on, God's using it in your life in a powerful way. There was a guy named Harlan, and Harlan, when he was 65 years old, he owned a restaurant, and that restaurant had a bad thing happen. A highway went in right by the restaurant, but unfortunately, where his restaurant was, they did not have an access ramp. So that highway gets put in. Everybody starts taking the highway. Nobody was on the feeder roads, and because of that, nobody stopped at his restaurant anymore. He, he put all of his money into it, trying to keep it afloat. And then shortly after realized that it was worthless, it wasn't going to make it. So at 65 years old, everything that he had put his life into disappears. He gets his first social security check, realizes it's not enough to live on. He looks at and evaluates his life. He doesn't have much, but the one thing that his restaurant was known for was his chicken. And so he had this chicken recipe that his mother had given him. And so he just decided as a 65 year old that he would take his chicken recipe, he would make chicken and he would go to different restaurants and he would try and get them to try the chicken. And if they liked the chicken, his deal was, you use my recipe and then just give me a few cents for every piece of chicken that you sell. And so he makes some chicken, he goes to the first restaurant, they say no. Second restaurant, they say no. Third restaurant, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. On the 19th restaurant, after 18 different rejections, he shows up at the 19th re restaurant, guess what they said? They said no to. Still no. So he goes an entire year, an entire year of over and over and over and over again getting rejected. Over 500 rejections, 500 no's. But in the 507th restaurant, he shows up, he makes his chicken, he lets them taste it. They taste it and guess what that person said? They said no as well. <laughs> Two years, 1,009 no's. Now, now pause for a second and just, Think if you're Harlan's friend, you're Harlan's buddy, and you're watching him every day go out, get rejected over and over and over and over again. A, a thousand nine rejections in two years. I mean, that means it's not like he's just getting rejected once a day. He's getting rejected multiple times a day. Probably you as a caring individual at some point would bring your friend aside and say, hey, maybe your chicken's just not that good. Like, I love you, but I just think we need to give up. I think you need to quit but he didn't quit. And this thousand tenth restaurant said yes. And once he had the thousand tenth restaurant, he got another and then another and then another and another. Two years, 1,009 no's, he persevered anyway. He continued to go forward. And eventually, nine years after his restaurant closed down, he took all those restaurants that he had contracts with, he sold it for what now is worth about $20 million. Of course, with inflation, maybe even since I read that stat, it's up to 25, I don't know. But here's the picture of Harlan, who you know as Colonel Sanders. A thousand nine no's until a thousand ten. It's a picture of perseverance. It's a picture of continuing forward. You see, here's the beauty in life in any story 
is that every great story has difficulty along the way. Every great story has trials. Every great story has conflict. That if you're reading a book and it's happy from the beginning to end and there's never a challenge and there's never difficulty and there's never a suffering, it's not a very good book. But oftentimes in our life, the same thing is true. God is telling this beautiful, beautiful story. But in the moment that we're living in the story, when we hit that wall, hit that pain, hit that suffering, we only wanna get past it. But can I tell you friends, that eventually in life when we pursue God and we are mature and complete, not lacking anything, it's in those moments in life that we can look back at the pit, at the suffering and recognize that God was good even in those moments and even when it didn't feel that way. That God is writing a story in your life and we can't see the end, but he does. Now that doesn't mean that you're gonna look back and like the pain. Five years later, I've never once looked back and said, I'm glad that my daughter died. Every day I wish that my daughter wouldn't have died. That will never change. At the end of my life, if God could line up every good thing that came because of her death and said, are you still, are you glad that, that it happened? I would still say no. I would still say hundred times out of hundred that I would rather have my daughter than all the good that might happen because of her death. But here's what I can say with perspective. I can say that God has grown me. God has grown my wife and I's relationship, our family's relationship, our relationship with God in a powerful and amazing way. God did not cause her death. He allowed her death, but it means that through that, through the circumstance, God can do great things in it and through it. But we have to persevere. Three things that we need if we're gonna persevere. Here's what it requires. The first thing is patience. Second thing is prayer. Third thing is perspective. Patience, even in the suffering. Patience is hard. I feel like patience is harder today in our culture than it ever has been because everything we do is so fast and so quick and so at our fingertips. I had lunch with our interns this week. All of our interns, there's, there's 10 of them, about 10 of them, and they're all in college. So they're all between the ages of about 18 and 22. And so we were having a little conversation about generations, so the difference between millennials and Gen Z. And one of those defining characteristics is always that a generation grows up with something radically different, different worldview, different, excuse me, circumstance than, than the generation before them. So as we're talking, we're talking about the internet. And I'm trying to describe them what the internet was like 20 years ago. And they were staring at me like I had a third eyeball in the middle of my forehead. Like they're just looking at me like, wait, what? Wait, wait, how did you used to get on the internet? And so I start trying to describe this noise, this sound to them that is connected to the internet and what, what used to be a part of the internet. And, and they just, they weren't tracking at all. And so finally I pull out my phone and I played for them this sound right here. Now, anyone in the room that's under the age of probably 30 is listening to this saying, what is going on right now? I, I, what, what is happening? And I'm trying to describe to the interns, this was the internet. This is how we connected to the internet, that your phone in your computer made a phone call and connected through the modem and that's how the internet worked. And they're looking at me, I mean, one of them in their mind, they're thinking, did they have cars when you were growing up? <laughs> I'm like, they can't even comprehend. And then I'm trying to describe how slow the internet was. Like, even after all that, you would try and load a picture and it would load line by line by line by line. And again, they're looking at you like, I, I just can't fathom a world that exists where that was the internet. Because we're used to now instantaneous everything. And sometimes the challenge with that is that we can get impatient even in small things, which means that when we're in the really big things and we need patience, we're not used to practicing patience. And so when you're going through a difficulty, a challenge, and we're supposed to have patience in that, it's really hard because what do we want? We want instantaneous, we wanna move past it, we wanna skip over it, but we have to be steadfast. We have to be patient. If we're gonna persevere, we have to be patient. We have to have prayer. It's this idea that James is talking about that God is the source of all wisdom. And so focus and turn your eyes towards him. 
the, the temptation, what we want to do is focus our eyes on the pain, focus our eyes on the suffering, focus our eyes on all the things that are going wrong and hurt. But he's saying, lift your eyes up and focus on me. Spend your time in prayer. The author of this book, James, had a, a few different nicknames, but one of his nicknames was Camel Knees, which sounds like a really weird nickname. The reason they called him Camel Knees is because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees looked like the knees of camels. Probably still not a cool nickname that you should name somebody, but it shows the lifestyle by which James lives. That if we're gonna make it, we need to have patience. We need to have prayer. We need to have perspective. We need to be able to look at the pain that we're going through and recognize that God is still all loving, still all sovereign, still in control, even when it doesn't feel like it in the moment. Looking through what we're going through and recognizing that God can use it for his glory, have that perspective on our life. Uh, there's a great quote by an old Presbyterian pastor from a hundred years ago, it says this, it is the easiest thing in the world to obey God when he commands us to do what we like and to trust him when the past is all sunshine. The real victory of faith is to trust God in the dark and through the dark. And when everything's great in life, it's easy to trust God. It's easy to praise God. It's easy to say, God, I love you. But when the bottom falls out and you're in a challenge and you're in a difficulty, that's when it's hard. And yet that's when it's so much more important for us to lean in and focus on him. See, oftentimes we do the wrong things. Let's talk about three things that are wrong that we often do to try and persevere. The first thing that we do is we try and numb the pain. You're going through a challenge, you're going through a difficulty. Instead of focusing on God and working through it and moving past it, we just say, I wanna numb the pain. You might numb the pain through some type of substance. You might numb the pain through distraction. You might numb the pain through just TV. But in, instead, what, what is it doing? It's not helping you work past what's going on. It's an unhealthy way to deal with the challenges in our life. The second is that we often isolate ourselves and I get it. When we were going through that difficult circumstance, I didn't wanna to talk to anybody. I just wanted to curl up in a ball by myself and cry. And I did cry all the time, I still do. But one of the biggest graces of our life was that one, we had kids, our older two kids that they still needed mom and dad. And so that we were constantly drawn out from that cave. And we also had loving friends and family that knew that we couldn't just be in isolation. And so they would draw us out and keep carrying us forward. That's the beauty of what church is supposed to be. And I get that maybe you've had a bad experience with church and maybe that hasn't been how you had community at church, but that's the goal, that's the heart. And we mess up sometimes, but instead of trying to do it by yourself, find a community so you're not isolated. Find a community that is helping you through that challenge and that difficulty. And the last thing is to not quit. Because that's what we wanna do. It's what we feel like. At some point when you've been carrying that burden for so long and it feels so hard and it feels so difficult, you just want to quit. But the best stories, the stories that have the greatest purpose in them are the moments when it seemed the darkest and the worst are the moments where they pushed through and they kept going. And then the conclusion is so beautiful because of the challenges that they faced. Colonel Sanders could have quit at 1,009 and then it's a story that none of us ever hear about. It's a story that's just sad and heartbreaking, but because of 1010, he's a guy that everybody knows. God is writing a story in your life and whether you're in the pain right now or at some point in the coming years, you will be in the pain. Recognize, it's not that God wants you to have that pain, but God does allow that pain and God is using it in your life for your good to do something that, life without the pain never could. There's a great book uh, called Grit, it's by Angela Duckworth. She also has a TED talk, fascinating TED talk. She studies people and, and what it looks like for people to have success. And she says, science shows that grit, the sustained application of effort towards a long-term goal is the biggest predictor of lifelong achievement. We often think that the biggest predictor of lifetime achievement is talent, circumstance, smarts, 
all these other things, but what they found when they study wild success is that grit, sustained effort over and over and over again, that's the biggest difference maker. Whatever you're going through, have grit, hang on, keep going. God will do an amazing thing on the other side. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for this message, this passage, that even in difficult circumstances in life, you give us a hope, you give us a way. So right now I pray for anyone in this room that is in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of that pain. God, it could be that a relationship just fell apart. Could be that their health has fallen apart. Could be that they've lost a loved one. Could be that their job has fallen apart. God, whatever they are going through right now, and I pray that they could recognize that there is hope, even though it doesn't feel like it, there is hope that if they would just turn their eyes towards you, you love them, you care for them, you wanna help them walk through this. And help us all, whether we're in the trials now or we will be in the trials, to understand how you want us to live in the midst of those things. We pray these things in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Hey, before we leave, if you are in here, and you are brand new, welcome. We are so glad that you're here. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. So to my left, to your right, we have Trailhead. And at Trailhead, we have a gift that we like to give anybody who's new to the church. Uh, it's a gift that inside, it could be cash, it could be keys to a new car. It, it's probably not those things, but it could be. You won't know unless you go over to Trailhead and have a conversation. Uh, we'd love to connect with you, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, maybe you're watching online or you can't, you don't have time to go over there. Uh, there's a QR code in the seat back in front of you or online, there's a little link and we'd love to connect with you that way. Fill out that information. We'll call you, answer any questions that you might have, really help you try and get connected and find community. Uh, also, if you're here and you need prayer, maybe you are in a pit right now. You're just going through that challenging circumstance, that difficulty. We would love to pray for you. So if you need prayer for anything, make your way over to Trailhead. We'd love to have that conversation. And if you're here and you don't know Jesus, can I tell you, the book of James is an awesome book, but if you don't know Jesus, the book of James is just moralistic teaching. But if you know Jesus, the book of James is transformational from head to toe of who you are. But it starts with knowing Jesus. So if you're here and you don't know him, you've never given your life to him, right, come over to Trailhead. Let us have a conversation with you. We would love to introduce you to the person of Jesus. Let's all stand together. We're gonna close in a word of prayer. Uh, something to be praying about this week, and we're going to pray for them right now, is that we've got 70 kids going off to youth camp this week. So we're going to pray that God does an amazing thing in their life. And I would encourage you, as it comes to your mind, to pray for them as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. God, we pray that as we go out, that we can have joy, regardless of what's going on in our life. We can have joy because we can weigh the circumstance and keep our eyes focused on you. Recognize that you're using anything Anything broken in our life, you're using for our good and for your glory. God, we do pray for our youth camp. We pray that you would move in a powerful and a profound way. The kids would come to know you. They would grow in a deeper way in their relationship with you. The lives would be transformed. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great week.